Thank you. We turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlaw. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. How would the First Minister characterise her legal guarantee to treat people within 12 weeks being missed in a quarter of all cases? First Minister. Well, as Jackson Carlaw is uh, well aware, he certainly should be uh, aware of it, this government is investing record sums in the National Health Service. Uh, we also see record numbers of people working in the National Health Service, but demand for our National Health Service is rising. That is ensuring uh, rising demand, uh, is ensuring uh, pressure on waiting times. That is exactly why we have in place the Waiting Times Improvement Plan, uh, which is backed by £850 million pounds of dedicated resources. And the first resources of that uh, have already, uh, of course, been allocated by the Health Secretary. I regret the fact that there are people who are not being treated within the treatment time guarantee, but I would also remind Jackson Carlaw that since that guarantee was introduced, over 1.7 million patients received the treatment within the required time frame. Uh, patients who perhaps would not have been treated within the 12-week uh, time frame had that guarantee not been in place. Jackson Carlow. Uh, well, frankly, the First Minister missing her legal guarantee in one in every four cases is surely uh, an unqualified failure. The First Minister talks about the efforts being made now, but let's look at her record in reducing waiting times. For example, Last year, the previous Health Secretary launched a big new campaign to recruit much-needed radiologists into Scotland, vital if we are to reduce waiting times. We now learn that this campaign resulted in the recruitment of just five staff. No wonder we saw a 38% rise in the number of us waiting for over six weeks for diagnostic tests in just the last year. Why should we have any faith in this government's promises now when we know previous much hype promises have flopped. First Minister. Well, in terms of radiology, as uh, I hope Jackson Carlaw is aware, uh, radiology is actually experiencing right now acute shortages worldwide, not just in Scotland. That is why we have increased training places in Scotland, and it's why we are acting to improve recruitment. Uh, it's also worth noting, uh, I think, that since this government uh, took office, uh, consultant radiologists have increased by 45.4%. Uh, and by 2022, we'll have increased specialty training places in radiology by approximately 75% from 2014. Uh, levels and the international radiology recruitment campaign uh, launched in 2018 generated interest from clinicians around uh, the globe and health boards are now finalising a number of offers of appointments. So I hope Jackson Carlaw uh, will have the good grace uh, to welcome some of that. I do, before I finish this answer, President Officer, I just want to draw attention uh, to the, the Chamber and indeed to Jackson Carlaw in particular to a letter that's in uh, today's Times newspaper signed by 24 medical professionals uh, across Scotland and I just want to quote it to Jackson Carlaw. As doctors, nurses and healthcare professionals from Scotland, we see the damage Brexit is already inflicting on our treasured National Health Service. The loss of thousands of European staff has led to crippling staff shortages. So I take my responsibilities seriously. When are the Tories going to take their responsibility for the damage they are doing to our National Health Service? Jackson Carlaw. But the acute shortage in radiologists was identified in 2014 by the First Minister's logic. By the First Minister's logic, it was clearly the uncertainty caused by Scottish independence then that was responsible for that. And of course, it's not just the wait to get into hospital, it's the safety and cleanliness of the hospitals in which doctors and nurses have to work and in which patients are treated. As the Health Secretary rightly said earlier this week, public confidence has been shaken by the infection outbreaks we've seen reported in recent weeks. Can I ask the First Minister, how many safety and cleanliness inspections have taken place in Scotland's hospitals in each of the last five years? First Minister. Uh, I don't have that precise information to hand, uh, but I will ensure that it is provided to uh, Jackson Carlaw. What I do know 
is that over recent years, uh, this trend started when I was Health Secretary. And before I say this, I'm uh, not in any way underplaying the experiences that have been uh, seen at the Queen Elizabeth in recent uh, times. Uh, but infection rates in our hospitals have reduced dramatically. Yep. For some infections, the reductions have been over 80%. Uh, that's down to the dedicated work uh, that's done by cleaners and others in our hospitals. And I hope Jackson Carlaw would recognise uh, that. So we continue to take these responsibilities seriously. But go back to the, the point uh, I, I made earlier on, uh, and Jackson Carlaw referred to it being my logic. Uh, the words that I quoted were not my words, they're not the Health Secretary's words, uh, they're the words of health professionals across Scotland. And I repeat them and ask perhaps Jackson Carlaw to respond to them. The loss of thousands of European staff has led to crippling staff shortages. Uh, the government, the UK government's Brexit deal would be terrible for Britain and for patients' health. We cannot allow Brexit to cause more damage than it already has. That's why we urge MPs to stop this harmful Brexit. Those are the words of health professionals. Will Jackson Carlaw respect them? Jackson Carlaw. Presiding officer, if, if you're very keen to establish a, a, an opposition leader's question time each week for 45 minutes, then I'm very happy to answer questions then. But this is First Minister's questions. And what, and what, we've, all become, and what we've all become used to is Nicola Sturgeon referring back to her ever bigger book of excuses, which, like Pinocchio's nose, has grown much bigger since the start of this year. The figures... The figures were answered. The figures to the question I asked were answered in a parliamentary question last night. So let me enlighten the First Minister. From a high, from a high of 38 safety and cleanliness inspections in 2014-15 to just 19 in 2017-18 and only 14 over the last 11 months. Less than half the number of just five years ago. Whatever excuses are given by the First Minister, I think most people will conclude that's also a failure and it's unacceptable. So can I suggest that when this government legislates to set a guarantee, it meets it. And that when people lack confidence in the cleanliness of hospitals, the record under the Scottish Government isn't to cut the number of inspections by half. Doesn't the First Minister agree? First Minister. Well... First of all, uh, Jackson Callow's response here that he doesn't really fancy uh, addressing the point will come as no comfort to health professionals yeah. worried about Brexit, the length and breadth of this country. But I would suggest that perhaps Jackson Carlaw does a bit more delving into how the healthcare environment inspectorate does its work. It decides uh, on the inspections that it carries out. It decides on the schedule of those. Its inspections, as we discussed just a couple of weeks ago, are risk-based. And this is a point that perhaps Jackson Carlaw doesn't know. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, to cleanliness inspections, the HEI now does thematic inspections, ah. which look at the broader patient experience and will often include uh, cleanliness and infection rates in hospitals. So perhaps uh, a little bit uh, more research on Jackson Carlaw's uh, part here uh, would pay dividends. But I come back to the point here. We've had uh, some experiences that Jackson Carlaw and I have discussed in recent weeks uh, about infection outbreaks at uh, the Queen Elizabeth and uh, the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Uh, those are serious and they are taken seriously. Uh, but the overall trend in infection rates is downward in Scotland's Absolutely. hospitals. Yeah. Uh, when I was Health Secretary in the early days uh, of my time as Health Secretary, C. diff, MRSA, big, big concerns uh, in our hospitals, 80 plus percent reductions in those infections. And for Jackson Carlaw not to recognise that doesn't do a disservice to me or to the health secretary. It does an enormous disservice to staff right across our national health service. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, the 45 day consultation to decide the future of the Caledonia Railway Works in Glasgow ends in just four days' time. So time is running out. Time is running out to save this critical part of Scotland's railway infrastructure and to save these 200 highly skilled jobs. Can the First Minister update the Chamber on what steps her government has taken to safeguard these jobs and to retain this site? First Minister. Well, as Richard Leonard knows, uh, the 
minister involved uh, has taken a very close interest in this. It has uh, spoken to uh, unions, has spoken to the companies. Uh, the company has encouraged uh, the company to extend the consultation uh, in order to allow other options to be properly uh, investigated, including uh, options that would involve uh, Transport Scotland. We continue. The consultation hasn't yet closed and we will continue to apply as much pressure as we possibly can on the company because the jobs are important and I think the way the workforce uh, is being treated is unacceptable. Richard Leonard. It's a good decision and I'm glad we've reached this outcome because it allows us to protect not just the asset, but the jobs that directly and indirectly depend on it. That's what Nicola Sturgeon said after she took Prestwick Airport into public ownership in 2013. If it was good enough for an airport then, why is it not good enough for our railways now? First Minister. Well, Richard Leonard should uh, understand and appreciate, I hope, uh, that before we can take a decision uh, like the one we took around Presswick Airport, which I think was a good decision at the time, uh, we have to undertake due diligence. Uh, we have to look at all of the different aspects. Um, and that is why we have uh, encouraged uh, this company, Gemini Rail, to extend the consultation, because the current consultation period uh, is too short to allow any serious exploration of uh, alternative options. So I would hope Richard Leonard would uh, join with me now, even at this late stage, in asking the company to extend that, uh, because we are prepared to look at all options uh, for this, and we will continue to do that, because as Richard Leonard uh, has just demonstrated there, we do have a good record, an interventionist record, when it comes to saving industrial jobs across the country. Richard Leonard. Uh, but First Minister, this consultation ends in just four days' time. And I, wrote, and, I, and I wrote to you almost four weeks ago, stressing the urgency of the situation. And you have said nothing in response. The workers and their unions are awaiting a proper response as well. And so out there in the real world, what is at stake are people's livelihoods and a national transport asset. So will you take decisive action? Will you step in? And will you bring the Caledonia Railway Works back into public ownership. First Minister. Well, in, in terms of saying nothing, I think Michael Matheson has led two parliamentary yeah. debates in this. There has been uh, ministerial discussion and engagement on this, uh, and we will continue to look at and consider all options. But, but I say to Richard Leonard, in all seriousness, the consultation timescale is not within my gift. It's not me that has set that. It is not the government that has set that. We continue to call on the company to extend that timescale. It's worth noting uh, that the Works has an order book for ScotRail train refurbishment that runs until July. So there is absolutely no need to proceed uh, so quickly and as quickly as the company is doing. Uh, Scottish Enterprise is working towards having a rail engineering hub at one or more locations across Scotland uh, where heavy maintenance or innovation can take place. Uh, work on that is underway and Scottish Enterprise have been carrying out discussions with the site owner uh, on how these works could fit into that strategic hub idea. So we will continue to look positively at all options. Uh, but I ask Richard Leonard to join with me in calling on the company to extend the consultation. So if he has, I can't remember if he has uh, one more uh, question, perhaps he can take the opportunity now to do so. But as we have done at Presswick, as we have done uh, in a range of other cases, we will always act in the best interests of workers and jobs across the country. Thank you. We have a, we have a few constituency supplementary questions. The first from Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I would like to raise a constituency case of a young woman with whom I met recently. In 2015, at the age of 17, and after the tragic death of her mother, my constituent took on the responsibility for caring for two of her younger siblings. North Lanarkshire Council's Social Work Department were in full knowledge of her circumstances and indeed visited my constituent's home to assess its suitability prior to her siblings moving in. However, since 2015, and despite verbally seeking support on a number of occasions, my constituent has never been able to access additional financial support as a kinship carer. Does the First Minister agree with me that this case raises serious concerns that vulnerable families may be failing to access the support to which they are entitled? 
First Minister. Well, can I thank Claire Adamson for raising uh, this tragic case? It is indeed a, a sad and tragic situation for all three siblings. And I know everyone here will recognise uh, the circumstances that Claire Adamson has shared with us. Uh, I know from speaking to kinship families the impact that bereavement has on children and carers. And it is really important that everyone involved is able to access the support that they are entitled to. We would expect a local authority to carefully assess the needs of a carer and children in a situation such as this and to consider what support financial or otherwise is appropriate. Uh, the Scottish Government funds Citizens Advice Scotland to provide a specialised advice service including information on financial and legal matters and we continue to work with social security colleagues including those at Westminster to ensure that kinship carers can access a range of benefits to alleviate the additional costs of caring uh, and I would be happy to ask the Minister to speak with Claire Adamson to see if there is any uh, further assistance and help the Scottish Government can offer in this particularly tragic case. Peter Chapman to be followed by Claire Baker. Presiding officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recent figures showing over 9,000 people were waiting beyond the 12-week target for inpatient or day case admission within NHS Grampian. And does the First Minister recognise that this figure has been rising every year and it is now eight times higher than it was in 2013? That the NHS Grampian is the worst funded health board in Scotland with a shortfall of £239 million over the past decade based on your own official figures? And does the First Minister agree with me that the people of the North East deserve much better? First Minister. Well, as I uh, said in response to Jackson Carlaw, uh, waiting times are not uh, as good as we want them to be uh, or as good right now as patients uh, deserve uh, them to be. That's why we have the waiting times improvement plan in place backed by the £850 million of dedicated resources uh, that I've already uh, spoken about uh, today and the Health Secretary will continue to work with health boards to ensure that we see the improvements that need to be made. Uh, we do know there are record resources going into the health service and all health boards. We know there are record numbers of people uh, working in our health service but the rising demand is creating that pressure and we must respond to that pressure. Uh, finally, I would, uh, as I have done frequently in this chamber, simply remind the Tories again uh, that had we followed their advice in uh, budget decisions uh, this year and last year, we would be grappling with a situation right now where we had £550 million pounds less yes. to invest yes. in our yes. public services no and our national health That's service in particular. Um, I know the it. Tories don't like that, but it is a fact, and it's one that I think it is about time they started to face up to. Claire Baker, to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. Uh, this week, the awarding of contracts for the Murray East and the Concardon offshore wind projects were announced, and so far, BIFAB have received no work. It is over a year since the yards, which were on the brink of closure, were purchased by DF Barnes with support from the Scottish Government, and there has been no employment at the Fife Yards or contracts since then. GMB and Unite are warning that the Fife Yards could end up with nothing as we see Scottish renewable projects being awarded to overseas companies and the Scottish supply chain being squeezed out. Could the First Minister provide her response to this situation and give an update on expectations for the future of the Yards in Fife? First Minister. Well, can I thank Claire Baker for raising uh, this issue, which is extremely uh, important and one uh, very close to my heart. Of course, it is important to note that BIFAB have secured a contract to fabricate 150 pin piles for the Murray East project. Uh, that contract will be at their Arnish yard and provide uh, work for 90 people, which uh, will start next month in, in March. Uh, beyond that, uh, we continue to work extremely hard and indeed I, I note uh, the unions uh, have been clear that they think both DF Barnes and the Scottish Government are fighting hard to secure contracts. Uh, we will continue to do that. Uh, I share the frustrations uh, of the unions and I, I share the frustrations uh, that Claire Baker has just articulated and uh, we will discuss with the unions some of the concerns uh, that they have and I'll uh, quote uh, I think Pat Rafferty and Gary Smith here when they talk about uh, BIFAB competing against established supply chains of preference. Uh, there are concerns uh, that BIFAB is not operating on a level playing field and I think it's important that those concerns are addressed. So in the short term we will continue to work as hard as we can uh, to secure work for BIFAB. We have uh, supported BIFAB uh, throughout uh, and in the medium to longer term work with the trade unions and others uh, to try to address any underlying issues 
uh, that are there that may be getting in the way of a successful uh, operation like BIFAB winning these contracts. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister agree with me that it's totally unacceptable for thousands, uh, for thousands of patients to be transferred to a different GP practice in another town due to GP shortages? And following the closure of another GP practice, will the Scottish Government commit to reviewing GP provision in Upper Annandale? First Minister. Well, in terms of the particular local issue, I'll ask the Health Secretary to look into that and to respond to the member. Of course, health boards have a, a duty to ensure that there uh, is GP provision for all of the patients that they uh, serve. And as the member will be aware, the Scottish Government is taking a range of actions from uh, increasing uh, places at medical schools uh, to increasing GP uh, training places <coughs> to incentive schemes to increase uh, the GP uh, workforce and will continue to invest uh, in those initiatives to address some of these shortages that do occur. Question three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. The government this week published its transport figures and they make for grim reading. We're all aware of the urgency of our environmental crisis and the impatience that people are expressing from school strikes to climate scientists. Nobody has looked at the February heat wave without recognizing this is not normal. We need to change the way that we live and do it urgently. And transport is one of the areas where the Scottish government has been repeatedly told it needs to do better. Mm -hmm. Yet we're seeing more road traffic, more air traffic, less bike use and less public transport use. Transport emissions have gone up 5% in the last five years when they should be going down. What's the government getting wrong on transport and what's it going to change? First Minister. Well, I actually agree with the broad thrust of Patrick Harvey's question. Uh, so I want to come on to uh, where I agree in a second, but just a, a couple of points uh, to note, which I think give better context to this. Uh, there have been increases in traffic volumes and I'll return to that, but it is worth noting that greenhouse gas emissions from road transport are lower now uh, than they were in 2007. Uh, in terms of aviation, uh, while we are seeing also an increase in aviation, uh, aviation currently accounts for less than 5% of total Scottish emissions. And of course, we're one of the few countries uh, anywhere in the world that include aviation emissions in the calculation of our overall climate change uh, targets. Uh, but generally speaking, I agree, it is important to encourage people to look at different uh, modes of transport. Uh, that's good not just for the climate, but it's good for public health as well. That's why uh, we're investing more than a billion pounds a year in public and sustainable transport to try to encourage people uh, onto public transport and active travel. That includes uh, £250 million uh, pounds a year to support our bus industry. Uh, we'll continue to, to make those interventions and look for improvements where we can. The Transport Bill, of course, aims to give local uh, transport authorities more flexibility around bus services. Uh, but the final thing I would say is this. I think it should make uh, all parties across this chamber uh, think long and hard about the kind of knee-jerk opposition that we see every time we do as much as contemplate anything that's designed to encourage people out of their cars. These statistics actually should be a wake-up call to all of us. Patrick Harvey. Well, the, the First Minister says that the government is encouraging public transport use, but we're still seeing a shift away from public transport use and toward car use. So it's not working. And the First Minister also says that we're counting our aviation emissions. Yes, we're counting them, but we're not cutting them. Counting them is only any use if it helps us to cut them. The reality is that transport emissions as a whole have not been going down, they've been going up. There's been no reduction at all since that long-term 30-year uh, trajectory around which we've been supposed to be cutting our emissions right across the economy. So we're still shifting away from public transport and active transport and toward car use when we should be going the other way. When will the government address the fundamental lack of any attempt at traffic demand reduction in its transport and climate change plans? First Minister. Well, we've doubled uh, our funding for active travel. Uh, we've taken that from 40 million to 80 million pounds a year. We did that in the previous year and we're maintaining that in this year, we're also supporting low emission zones and of course working uh, with the Greens, uh, we're proposing extra powers for councils uh, to do more uh, around this if they so choose uh, 
um, as well. So we are uh, taking a number of actions and Patrick Harvey is right, we should continue to look uh, for ways in which we can do more uh, and go further. Uh, but Patrick Harvey seemed to take issue with my use of the term encouraging people. You know, people do have choices around this. We cannot force people to use one form of transport over uh, another. What we can do is invest in the alternatives which we are doing um, and to make it as attractive as possible for people uh, to use uh, methods of transport other than cars. We will continue to do that. I hope we will continue to have the support of the Greens. Uh, and I do think there is a challenge to other parties here whose knee-jerk opposition uh, to initiatives sometimes get in the way of all of us trying to do the right thing. Question number four, Willie Rennie. In June 2017, I asked the First Minister about treating waiting times in our hospitals. She told me she was making targeted investment and was making sure improvements happen, but it got worse. In October 2018, I asked again. This time, the First Minister told me she had a funded plan that would substantially reduce waiting times. So on Tuesday, was the First Minister surprised that waiting time performance fell yet again? First Minister. Uh, no, I, I, I wasn't. And actually, if Willie Rennie had read the waiting times improvement plan, he wouldn't have been surprised at that either. It is regrettable uh, that we are where we are with waiting times, uh, but we set out very frankly uh, the challenge and the trajectory that waiting times uh, improvement would take. It's all set out there in black and white in the waiting times improvement plan. We are making uh, targeted investment. I've referred twice now to the £850 million pounds of invest investment to back that plan. Uh, just last week, the Health Secretary announced uh, almost £30 million, uh, including, for example, extra money to Forth Valley Hospital to deliver two new theatres by October this year, which will bring additional capacity for 1,500 more joint replacements. Uh, by June this year, the hospital will have a second MRI scanner to allow 8,000 more diagnostic examinations to take place uh, per year. The Golden uh, Jubilee will purchase an additional CT scanner, which will be operational by uh, next month, March, uh, which will provide an additional 10,500 images uh, annually. So these are the targeted investments uh, that will deliver uh, the improvements in waiting times that the improvement plan set out very clearly. Willie Rennie. But it's been eight years since this law was passed and it's been eight years of excuses just like that. It seems the longer that people have to wait, the bigger the excuses from this First Minister. Nic Nicola Sturgeon told us her patient rights law was the way to cut waiting times. But it is just flim-flam. Tricking patients doesn't get them treated any quicker. The law is broken 200 times every day. 13,000 were waiting, now it's 18,000. What are the consequences for the First Minister if she breaks her own law next time and the time after that and the time after that? Will the First Minister pay any price for this? Or is it only the patients who are going to suffer? First Minister. Well, we'll continue to focus on doing uh, the job that we are elected uh, to do as a government, which is to deliver the improvements that are set out in that plan. Uh, we will back that with record investment, record numbers of people working in our National Health Service. We know demand is rising, so health services across the world are having to deal with that challenge. Scotland is actually doing it better than any other health service across the United Kingdom uh, right yeah. now. But in terms of the record of this government overall, I mean, in terms of uh, people waiting longer than 12 weeks for treatment, it's worth uh, noting that since this government took office in uh, the year 2007, uh, the numbers waiting longer than 12 weeks is actually reduced by 21%. Uh, That's not good enough. That has to go down further. It was 104,867 in 2006-07, uh, it's 82,660 now. That's not good enough, but we will continue to target the investments to make sure we see the improvements that patients have a right to expect. So further supplementaries, the first from Bob Doris, followed by Jenny Mara. Bob Doris. Uh, um, thank you, President Officer. The Caledonian Railway, what's previously referred to as in my constituency, can I draw the First Minister's attention to a live tender? The company Porterbrook will determine on about which company gets the work to refurbish around 100 Class 70 170 carriages, some of which will be run on the ScotRail network. That could, if it goes to Springburn, secure around 40 jobs for around three years. I've written to Porterbrook 
uh, commending the skills and dedication of that workforce at the Cali. I very much hope that they secure that work. Whilst I appreciate the First Minister cannot directly interfere in a tender process, does she agree with me that Gemini has got an absolute responsibility to bid for that work, to seek to bring to Springburn Yard, to halt the 45-day notices and threats of redundancy, and to offer hope to my constituents, not redundancies? Yeah. First Minister. Yes, I, I agree 100 per cent with Bob Doris, and I would commend him highly on the way he has defended uh, the jobs and interests of his constituents uh, in this particular uh, case. Uh, Gemini should uh, remove the threat of redundancy, it should extend uh, the consultation, it should certainly be prepared to bid for any work that is going and give all of us time to look at all options to secure these jobs for the future. Jenny Mara to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. The First Minister will be aware of NHS Tayside asking her government for £12 million for repairs to an outdated electrical system at Ninewells Hospital and a huge backlog of maintenance. It is not, I believe, in the public financial interest for boards to come back asking for more money and millions to be sent on, spent on piecemeal repairs to our hospitals. Glasgow has a new hospital, Edinburgh and new facilities in Aberdeen. If the business case adds up and is sustainable, Will the First Minister commit to replacing the oldest acute hospital in Scotland and support a new hospital in Dundee? First Minister. Well, business cases uh, are looked at uh, robustly uh, and properly, as are uh, all requests uh, for funding uh, by health boards for uh, backlog maintenance, which is uh, uh, the situation uh, in this case. Uh, the Scottish Government's Capital Investment Group is tasked uh, with doing that, and uh, that is the process that is in accordance uh, with capital projects of this uh, scale. So I would encourage the health board to continue to talk to uh, the government and to the capital investment group so that proper decisions can be taken uh, in these matters in the proper Per way. Jenny Gilbreth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last night at Westminster, all parties had the chance to rule out a no deal Brexit, but instead the Tories chose to put 100,000 Scottish jobs at even greater risk. With just 29 days until Brexit, what is the First Minister's message to Theresa May? First Minister. Well, it is scandalous that we are now just at 29 days from Brexit catastrophe being inflicted upon Scotland uh, by the Tories. Uh, last night, all parties, including uh, Scotland's Tory MPs, had the opportunity to vote for Ian Blackford's amendment and uh, remove the risk of no deal, not just at the end of March, but remove the risk of no deal forever. It is absolutely disgraceful uh, that the Scottish Tory MPs uh, refused to do that. And I have to say, Order, please. watching... Watching David Mundell, the so-called Secretary of State for Scotland, squirming in an interview last night, trying to explain why he didn't vote for that amendment, it was quite mind-boggling. Uh, the Tories are no longer uh, standing up. They never were, but they certainly are not now standing up for Scotland's interests. And if that Brexit catastrophe hits, then every single one of them will bear the responsibility. OK, question number five, Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government is confident that it will end traditional black bag waste and a range of recyclable materials being buried in the ground by its target of 2021. First Minister. Well, since 2012, there has been a statutory duty to recycle in Scotland, so recyclable materials should not be going to landfill nor to energy from waste. Uh, Scotland has already met relevant EU targets, however, our forthcoming ban on biodegradable municipal waste to landfill from January 2021 deliberately goes further and sets a marker for our environmental ambitions. As such, it is disappointing that there's uncertainty around the readiness of some councils to deliver this. We're aware of the significant challenges associated with delivering the ban and are working with public and private sector partners to tackle those challenges. Our focus now is on working with authorities who do not have a solution in place to identify ways that they can comply with the ban as soon as possible. Christine Graham. I thank the First Minister for her answer on challenges. Can I advise the First Minister that having recently purchased a small musical toy torch with whirly coloured lights for granddaughter aged one, it took me at least 20 minutes to remove it from its packaging with the aid of a Phillips screwdriver, I would add. <laughs> Illustrating yet again that fighting packaging seems a losing battle. Even the humble turnip is now pre-wrapped, for goodness sake. 
What can the Scottish Government do to reduce idiotic and wasteful packaging, perhaps starting with toys and turnips, which would certainly help reduce its targets by 2021? Yeah, yeah. Mr. Minister. I should perhaps begin by saying I'm relieved to hear that the uh, toy torch with whirly coloured lights was for Christine Graham's granddaughter. <laughs> um, but on the, on the serious issue, I agree that plastic packing is something that we all need to tackle. Uh, the government is committed to substantially reducing unnecessary and difficult to recycle packaging uh, to increase recycling rates. Uh, earlier this month, we, along with other UK administrations, commenced a consultation on reform of packaging uh, producer responsibility across the UK, ensuring business meets the full cost uh, of managing packaging at end of life. And that consultation will run until the 13th of May. In the meantime, we will continue to explore how any new arrangements might best be given effect, including how they align with our plans to introduce a deposit return scheme for drinks containers in Scotland. Boris Golden. Uh, I declare an interest with respect to my previous work within the environment sector. Uh, presiding officer, there is genuine cross-party concern that many environmental targets will not be met, in part due to a failure to take an evidence-based approach when setting targets and indeed subsequent weak implementation plans. For example, banning plastic straws without knowing their weight and volume, cutting food waste by a third without knowing how much food there's waste there was, and now the 2021 waste to landfill ban. Would the First Minister accept that our environment targets and implementation require a robust evidence-based approach? First Minister. I have to say it is a bit rich for any Tory to stand up and talk about evidence bases and uh, the importance of environmental action uh, given the knee-jerk opposition to workplace uh, parking uh, discretionary powers for councils that we've seen in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but on this, we will always act in an evidence-based uh, way. Uh, and in terms of the 2021 uh, ban, I think that is right, because it sets a level of ambition that we should all be working towards. Uh, and of course, 14 local authorities uh, already have a long-term solution in place, and that includes our major authorities like Glasgow, Edinburgh and Dundee. So our focus now will be working with those authorities who don't have a solution in place so that we can identify ways for them to meet that target as quickly as possible. Question number six, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister what engagement the Scottish Government plans with the SQA to prevent possible strike action during the forthcoming summer exams. First Minister. Well, I would urge the SQ and unions to continue uh, constructive discussion to reach a resolution. The Deputy First Minister uh, met with the SQA's Chief Examiner uh, just yesterday and sought assurances that the SQA is taking all appropriate measures to ensure that uh, the exam diet is not disrupted and we will continue to monitor the situation closely. Liz Smith. Uh, could I thank the First Minister for that uh, response? Uh, parents and pupils across Scotland are already, quite rightly, very worried about the possibility of strike action with some teachers, and now they have this additional worry that there could be strike action at SQA, at what I think the Chamber would agree would be quite the worst time in the school year. Six days ago, in the Herald newspaper, a member of the SQA was quoted as saying that they have in place robust contingency plans. So could the First Minister tell parents and pupils exactly what the Scottish Government believes these contingency plans to be? First Minister. Well, there is an annually updated contingency plan uh, in place to respond to any scenario uh, that might pose a risk to uh, the qualification system, and the Deputy First Minister will be happy to write to Liz Smith with more detail of that. But of course, uh, we want to ensure that that contingency plan here is not required, and that uh, should be our focus. I think it should be noted that the proposed ballot at the SQA is of a relatively small number of staff, around one in 10 of their roughly 1,000 uh, staff. That said, industrial action would not be in the interest of young people. That's why I do urge the SQA and the unions to continue the discussions uh, to reach a resolution, and we will remain in touch with the SQA on this matter. Uh, on the wider uh, issue of uh, teachers, the offer that has been made to teachers in terms of pay uh, is the best offer that has been made to any group of public sector workers, not just in Scotland, but anywhere in the uh, UK. It would see 
uh, teachers' salaries in April of this year increase uh, by a minimum of 9% compared to uh, current salaries. Uh, and I hope we can reach a resolution of that dispute uh, in the near future as well, because it is not in anybody's interest to see industrial action in any part of our education system. Jackie Bailey. The First Minister will be aware that pay talks between Colleges Scotland and the EIS have broken up less than an hour ago with no improved offer from the employers on the table. There is now the very real prospect of further strike action over the coming weeks affecting colleges across Scotland, including West College Scotland that covers my own constituency. So would the First Minister agree that the pay claim made by college lecturers is entirely in keeping with the government's public sector pay policy and would she therefore instruct the Cabinet Secretary for Education to perhaps take a less passive role to make sure there is a reasonable settlement reach soon something he has done in the past. First Minister. Well, the government doesn't take a passive role in any of these things, but we do respect, we do respect negotiations. And uh, as somebody who uh, I'm sure would describe themselves as a, a trade unionist or a trade union supporter, I, I would hope that that is something Jackie Bailey would also do, uh, respect. Uh, collective bargaining and uh, ongoing negotiations in any uh, particular sector. Uh, in terms of college lecturers, um, I would certainly hope that we do get people back round the table and a resolution can be reached. Uh, this dispute, just to remind uh, the Chamber, is about a cost of living pay uplift over and above the harmonisation increase, which on average uh, saw 9% pay increases over uh, three years for college uh, lecturers. And the EIS FILA view that as distinct from uh, the, the cost of living uplift as distinct from the harmonisation deal. Uh, obviously, employers take uh, a different view of that. So I, again, I would encourage them to get back round the table and to reach a resolution that is in the interest of lecturers, but also in the interest of students across the country. Question number seven, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on a ban on live animal exports. First Minister. Well, the Government is committed to the highest possible welfare standards for animals and to ensuring that livestock in Scotland are transported uh, where that is necessary, uh, humanely and uh, with respect and dignity. Uh, we recognise there are complexities and certainly we recognise the concerns around transportation. Uh, our position is that ideally the process of quality meat production should take place uh, close to where animals are born and reared. Uh, we're also working with the farming sector to explore ways of rearing more male dairy calves productively and profitably rather than exporting them. Colin Smith. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but does the First Minister agree that, that the scenes of, of weeks old unwanted calves being transported hundreds of miles for hours on end from Scotland to Ramsgate to then be shipped abroad purely for slaughter, potentially in countries whose animal welfare conditions are inferior to our own, does nothing to enhance the reputation of Scotland and our vital agriculture industry. Is the First Minister really satisfied with the conditions those calves are being transported in? And will the First Minister show leadership on this issue, send a clear signal that the Scottish Government will bring an end to live animal exports for slaughter, and if the rest of the UK introduces such a ban, state now that Scotland will not seek an opt-out. First Minister. Well, firstly, there is, uh, there is currently no transport of livestock from Scotland to continental Europe for immediate slaughter. Uh, there is transport for uh, rearing, and that's where, as I said in my initial answer, we are exploring uh, alternatives to that so that more male dairy calves can uh, productively and profitably be reared uh, rather here rather than being exported. Uh, it's also important to point out uh, that there are very high standards of welfare in place and we expect all legislation and rules on the transport of livestock to be adhered to. The Animal and Plant Health Agency approves export journey plans on behalf of Scottish ministers and it investigates any non-compliance uh, with those plans. Uh, we do recognise uh, the concerns that have been raised and we're committed to working with the sector to explore alternatives to uh, live exports. In terms of the possibility of a ban, the Scottish Government consented to the UK Government's call for evidence on proposals uh, to ban export uh, to slaughter and we await uh, the result uh, of that review before deciding uh, what further action should be taken. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business. In the name of Alexander Stewart on World Hearing Day and Hearing Awareness Week 2019. But before then, we'll just have a short suspension to allow the gallery to clear, to allow members and ministers to change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>